Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about how to integrate functions that will lead to inverse hyperbolic functions. And so previously we learned the derivative rules for the inverse hyperbolic functions, but now what we want to do is reverse this process to find the integration rules for these inverse hyperbolic functions, right? Because remember that differentiation and integration are opposite operations. And so if we integrate the derivative of these functions, we will get back the original inverse hyperbolic function. However, notice that similar to the inverse trigonometric functions and their derivative rules, that the derivative rules for the inverse hyperbolic functions come in pairs. And so what I mean by that is look at these first two derivative rules here for inverse hyperbolic sine and inverse hyperbolic cosine. Their derivatives are very similar. We have u prime divided by the square root of u squared plus one for inverse hyperbolic sine, and for inverse hyperbolic cosine, we have the same thing, except in the denominator here, inside our square root, we have u squared minus one, not plus one. And so these two functions have very similar derivatives. And then if you look at the inverse hyperbolic tangent function and the inverse hyperbolic cotangent function, they actually have the exact same derivative, right? U prime divided by one minus U squared. But now if you remember from our previous lesson, we talked about how they're actually not the same exact function because they are defined for different values of X. However, their structure is exactly the same. And then finally, look at our last pair of inverse hyperbolic secant and inverse hyperbolic cosecant where we also have derivatives that have a similar structure. For inverse hyperbolic secant, we have negative u prime divided by u times the square root of one minus u squared. And then the derivative of inverse hyperbolic cosecant is very similar, except we have the absolute value of u times the square root of one plus u squared, not minus u squared. And so not only are the derivatives for each of these pairs of functions similar, the actual definition of these inverse hyperbolic functions are also very similar and come in pairs. If you recall from our previous lesson, we looked at the logarithmic definitions for these inverse hyperbolic functions and notice that the same pairs of functions have very similar logarithmic definitions, right? The structure for inverse hyperbolic sine is very similar to the structure for inverse hyperbolic cosine. It's equal to the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus one compared to the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus one. And so then you can see for our other two pairs of inverse hyperbolic functions that their logarithmic definitions are also very similar. And so the reason I bring this up is that when we consider the integration rules for our inverse hyperbolic functions, we only need three integration rules, right? We only need one for each pair of functions and each of those rules is going to combine each of those pairs into one integration rule that can work for a particular type of function. And so let's take a look at these integration rules. And so here they are. These are going to be the three integration rules that we will use for functions that lead to inverse hyperbolic functions, right? So you'll notice that the answer or the solution to these three integrals are written in the logarithmic form of our inverse hyperbolic functions, okay? And so our first integral rule says that the integral of one divided by the square root of u squared plus or minus a squared times du, where u is a function of x and a is a constant, is equal to the natural log of u plus the square root of u squared plus or minus a squared plus c. And it's important to note that this plus or minus in this square root of our solution is dependent on this plus or minus in the square root of the function in the integral. If this is a plus in the actual function that we would be integrating, then this sign in the solution would be a plus. If this was a minus, then this would be a minus. Okay, and so our next rule is that the integral of one divided by a squared minus u squared times du is equal to one divided by two times a times the natural log of the absolute value of a plus u divided by a minus u plus c. And then our last integration rule is that the integral of one divided by u times the square root of a squared plus or minus u squared times du is equal to negative one divided by a times the natural log of a plus the square root of a squared plus or minus u squared divided by the absolute value of u plus c. And so similar to this integration rule, this plus or minus in this square root corresponds to this plus or minus in the function in your integral. Okay, and so you might be looking at these integration rules and notice that the functions in the integral are very similar 
to your integration rules for functions that lead to inverse trig functions. And so that might be a little confusing. In fact, the first time you see these, you might think that they are the exact same integration rules, but they're actually not, they are different. And so I wanna quickly highlight that so that you can see the differences between these integration rules for inverse hyperbolic functions and inverse trig functions before we go ahead and look at some examples of using these new rules for this video. All right, so here we're gonna do a quick comparison. We have our inverse trig integration rules right here, and then we have our new inverse hyperbolic integration rules right here. And so the reason I wanna compare these two sets of integration rules is look at how similar these functions are in the integrals, right? Each of these pairs of integration rules have some similarities, but they are different rules. All right, and so usually the difference between them has to deal with the order of the constant and the function u in the denominator of the function in your integral. And so let me show you what I mean. If you look at this rule for arc sine, we have one divided by the square root of a squared minus u squared, but for this integration rule, we have one divided by the square root of u squared plus or minus a squared, right? So the order at which a squared and u squared are being added or subtracted is different than the inverse trig rule. We have a squared minus u squared, but over here we have u squared plus or minus a squared. And so that's also going to be the case for our last pair of integration rules, but very quickly, let's look at this middle pair. The difference for these is just a plus or minus sign, right? So look at this integral. We have one divided by a squared plus u squared, but for this new integration rule, we have one divided by a squared minus u squared. So the order of them is the same. It's the plus or the minus that determines which rule to use. All right, and then for our last pair, just like I mentioned earlier, the only difference between these two rules is this plus or minus sign and the order of these two terms, right? In the square root of the denominator here, we have u squared minus a squared, but in the denominator for this new rule, we have a squared plus or minus u squared. And so the order of the constant and the function u is different for this rule compared to this rule. Okay, so try to keep that straight. That is the difference between these two sets of rules for inverse trig and inverse hyperbolic functions. And now that we have looked at the differences, we are ready to use these new integration rules with some examples. All right, so for our first example, we have the integral of three divided by the square root of nine x squared plus one times dx. And for this integral, we are going to be using this integration rule, which would correspond to our inverse hyperbolic sine and inverse hyperbolic cosine functions. However, we are using the logarithmic definition of those functions, okay? And so the reason we are using this integration rule for this function is because the structure of the functions in the integral are very similar. We have a constant one divided by the square root of u squared, a function of x, plus or minus a squared, a constant, and our integral here has three, a constant divided by the square root of nine x squared, a function of x plus one, a constant. And so we can set u squared equal to nine x squared and a squared equal to one, and we can solve for a and u, and we'll be able to rewrite this function into a better form to see how we would use this integration rule. So what we'll do, is we'll set u squared equal to nine x squared, and we'll set a squared equal to one, and then we'll take the square root of both sides of these equations to solve for u and a, and so we'll have that u is equal to the square root of nine x squared, and the square root of nine is three, and the square root of x squared would be x, and so we can just rewrite that to be three x. And then the square root of one is just one, and so a will be equal to one. Okay, and so we can rewrite this integral then to look like this. We'll have that this is equal to the integral of three divided by the square root of three x squared plus one squared dx. Right, I just rewrote this integral to better represent the structure of this function in our integration rule by writing out u squared and a squared explicitly. Right, we found that u is equal to three x, so we have three x squared, and a is equal to one, so we have one squared. And so now we have u squared plus a squared, but we really didn't change anything about this integral, right? This is still the same function that we have up here. It's just rewritten in a different way. 
And so now that we can see how this matches up with this integration rule or the function in the integral of this integration rule, we can now go through with our u substitution process and integrate this integral. And so we'll take the derivative of u here. We'll have that du dx is equal to three, right? The derivative of three x will be three because when you take the derivative of x to the power of one, it's just equal to its coefficient, which is three. And then let's solve for du by multiplying both sides by dx. So we'll have that du is equal to three dx. And so then whatever du is equal to, you wanna make sure that that can be found within your integral. And so we're looking for a three dx. And I see that right here, we have three times dx. And so we're good, we can use u substitution for this integral. And so if we rewrite this in terms of u, we will have that this is equal to the integral of one divided by the square root of u squared plus one squared times du. Right, we replaced three x with u because that's what we set it equal to. And we replaced three dx with du because that's what we found that that was equal to. And so now this integral right here matches up with this integration rule. And so if we use this rule, we will have that this is equal to the natural log of u plus the square root of u squared plus a squared, which is one. So we'll have one squared plus c, right? This is a plus, even though the integral rule says plus or minus, this is a plus because our function has a plus in that square root, right? So those two signs need to match up. All right, and so then all we need to do to finish this solution is to replace u with what we set it equal to. And so if we clean up our work, we will have that this is equal to the natural log of u, which is three x plus the square root of three x squared plus one plus c. However, we can rewrite this three x squared to be nine x squared because that's what that would be equal to. And so if we rewrite that to be nine x squared, that will complete this solution. And this will be the final answer to this integral. Next up, we have the integral of one divided by seven minus 16 times x squared times dx. And so in order to solve this integral, we are going to use this integration rule, which corresponds to our inverse hyperbolic tangent function and inverse hyperbolic cotangent function. But of course the answer is in logarithmic form. Okay, and so the reason we wanna use this derivative rule for this integral is because the structure of the function in the integral is very similar to the structure of this function in this integral for our integration rule. Right, we have one divided by a squared, a constant, minus u squared, where u is a function of x. And our function here is one divided by seven, a constant, minus 16x squared, which is a function of x. And so in this case, we will have that a squared is equal to seven, and u squared is equal to 16x squared. And so if we take the square root of both sides of each of these equations, we can solve for a and u. And so we'll have that a is equal to the square root of seven, and then u will be equal to the square root of 16 times x squared, and the square root of 16 is four, and the square root of x squared is x, and so we will have four x. Okay, so now that we know what a and u are equal to, we can rewrite this integral to better represent the integral in this integration rule, and so we'll have that this is equal to the integral of one divided by the square root of seven squared minus four x squared times dx. Okay, so now we can clearly see that we have a squared minus u squared, which matches up with this function in our integration rule. All right, and so now if we continue on with using the u substitution process, we can integrate this integral using this integration rule. And so if we take the derivative of u, we will have that du dx is equal to four. And then if we solve for du by multiplying both sides by dx, we will have that du is equal to four times dx. All right, but then whatever du is equal to, that needs to be found within our integral. And so we're looking for four times dx. However, I only see dx. I do not see a constant multiple of four in our integral here. And so we're gonna have to divide both sides of this equation by four. And so if we do that, we will have that du divided by four is equal to dx. And now we have a term of du that can replace something that we can find in our integral. Okay, so now we can rewrite this integral in terms of u. And so we will have that this is equal to the integral of one divided by the square root of seven squared minus u squared times du divided by four. And so if we clean up our work here, we can pull this one fourth to the outside of the integral. And so if we do that, I'll just rewrite the integral here. 
will have just du, but then in front of the integral, we will have one divided by four. So that's what that will be equal to. And now we can use this integration rule for this function. And so we'll have that this is equal to that one fourth times one divided by two times a. So we'll have one divided by two times the square root of seven times the natural log of the absolute value of a, the square root of seven, plus u divided by a, the square root of seven minus u. And then we will add c. All right, and so then all we have to do to finish this solution is to replace u with what we set it equal to, which was four x. And so we will have that this is equal to one fourth times one divided by two times the square root of seven. That will be one divided by eight times the square root of seven times the natural log of the absolute value of the square root of seven plus four x divided by the square root of seven minus four x and then plus c. And that will be the final solution to this integral or the antiderivative of this function. All right, so for our last example, we have the integral of one divided by x times the square root of four minus x squared times dx. And for this integral, we are going to use this integration rule that would correspond to our inverse hyperbolic secant function and our inverse hyperbolic cosecant function. But of course, once again, it is written in logarithmic form, and so we don't really see those inverse hyperbolic functions explicitly. Okay, and so the reason we are going to use this rule for this integral is because the structure of the function in this integral is similar to the structure of the function in this integral for this integration rule, right? We have one divided by u, a function of x, times the square root of a squared, a constant, plus or minus u squared, a function of x. And our integral over here is one divided by x times the square root of a constant four minus x squared. All right, and so in this case, we can set a squared equal to four and u squared equal to x squared. And so we will have that a squared is equal to four and u squared is equal to x squared. And so we can solve for a and u by taking the square root of both sides of these equations and we'll have that a is equal to two and u will be equal to x, okay? And so then notice that this u, which is equal to x, also matches up with this x in the denominator of this function. And so that also matches up with the function in our integration rule as well, because whatever u is equal to, that u also needs to be on the outside of that square root in the denominator of the function. And so we have x right here, which is what u is equal to. And so we're good. We can rewrite this integral to better represent our values of a and u. And so we'll have that this is equal to the integral of one divided by x times the square root of two squared minus x squared dx. Okay, and so now if we continue on with using u substitution, we'll take the derivative of u and we'll have that du dx is equal to one, right? The derivative of x is just one. And then if we solve for du, we'll multiply both sides by dx, and we'll have that du is equal to dx. And then whatever du is equal to needs to be found in our integral, which is pretty easy in this case, dx is right here. And so we can rewrite this integral in terms of u. And so we'll have that this is equal to the integral of one divided by u times the square root of two squared minus u squared times du, right? We just replaced x in both of these locations with u because that's what we set it equal to, and we replaced dx with du because that is what that is equal to. All right, and so now we can integrate this integral using this integration rule. And so if we clean up our work here, we will have that this is equal to negative one divided by a, which is two, times the natural log of a, which is two, plus the square root of a squared, which would be two squared, so that is four, minus u squared, and then we will divide that by the absolute value of u, and then add c. And so then before we finish this answer, just a quick note, this is a negative sign, even though we have plus or minus in the integration rule, because in the square root of our function, we have a squared minus u squared, okay? And so now all we have to do is replace u with what we set it equal to, which is x, and so I'm just going to go in here and replace u with x. And so we have x squared right there and the absolute value of x in the denominator. And now we have the final solution to this integral. 
Okay, and so now you've seen all of the integration rules in action. If you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.